14 minutes after 8 o'clock at 93.5, 1590 WAKR. It's time to bring him in. Film study professor. We go to film school each Friday at this time with my good friend Joe Fortunato. All right, let's bring him in. And we're going to go to another disaster film that Joe is very fitting for this day. I talked about this earlier this morning. This date, 1986, Chernobyl exploded. The world's worst nuclear disaster. Hmm, and that's kind of related to the film you're going to look at today. Absolutely. And good morning, Ray. Good morning, everybody. And, uh, you know, I love going back to the 70s for films, and that's what we're doing today with a film celebrating its 45th anniversary, released March 16th, 1979, The China Syndrome. Uh, which is, uh, I think, a, a, a little bit of a forgotten film uh, and a great one. So hopefully we're reminding some people about it. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's uh, you know related to Chernobyl. Uh, it's also probably most related to the Three Mile Island uh, catastrophe of that same year. And for those who don't know the film, uh, it's about a reporter played by Jane Fonda who finds what appears to be a cover-up of safety hazards at a nuclear power plant. And uh, it was directed by James Bridges, written by James Bridges, Michael Gray, and T.S. Cook. It was produced by Michael Douglas, who also stars in the film, uh, along with Jane Fonda and Jack Lemmon. It was nominated for four Oscars, uh, including Best Actor for Lemmon, Best Actress for Fonda, Writing and Art Direction. It was actually the only film that year to be nominated for both Best Actor and Best Actress at the Oscars. Uh, it also... Um, was nominated for the prestigious Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival that same year. And uh, the AFI has a list of 100 most heart-pounding films, and it's number 94 on that, on that uh, uh, list as well. And as I mentioned, this movie was released 12 days before the Three Mile Island nuclear accident in Pennsylvania, uh, which was uh, March 28, 1979. And since the movie came out only 12 days before the partial meltdown of the Three Mile Island nuclear plant, some conspiracy, and you know, history repeats itself, I guess, some conspiracy uh, theorists claim that the studio deliberately staged the accident to publicize the film. Uh, of course, uh, there's no evidence to that, and it's not true, uh, but they were linked in, and because of the, the disaster, um, the movie kind of became a blockbuster. It was probably not going to do as well uh, had that not, that, that tragedy uh, not happened. And uh, um, in fact, uh, nuclear power executives, when the fir- movie first came out, were lambasting the picture as this is sheer fiction. It's a character assassination on the entire industry. Uh, and then, of course, 12 days later, uh, something similar happened in real life. And um, at this point in his career, Michael Douglas was not a major star. Uh, he had won an Oscar for producing uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but as a uh, on-camera star, uh, he, that was not him. And uh, so the movie's leading man really is Jack Lemmon, and Douglas is sort of a heroine sidekick. He plays a cameraman to uh, Jane Fonda's reporter. Uh, Lemmon even has uh, sort of a romantic scene with Jane Fonda at a bar. And it wasn't really until five years later when Romancing the Stone came out that Douglas stepped out from uh, behind his father, Kirk Douglas's shadow, and became a star in his own right. Yeah, that's a great point, Joe, because uh, Michael Douglas was always was also a second-hand guy. Remember him in Streets of San Francisco on the television where he yeah. wasn't the main guy either. And you're exactly right. At the beginning of his career, he was the other guy, but uh, soon he would become the main guy. I remember when this movie came out, Joe, it hit so close to home because, remember, I'm from Pennsylvania, that a lot of people over there would not go see this movie because they were fearful that it was too close to home for them. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, you know, the movie's title uh, was a little bit confusing to some people. And mm-hmm. it was it, the, the title is based on the theoretical notion that if a nuclear meltdown would occur in the United States, the nuclear core would melt all the way through the Earth's core and emerge on the other side of the world in China. Uh, now, that's not realistic. Uh, you know, you can't melt through the Earth's core. Uh, so it's really a, just a metaphor for the other side of the world, China is. Uh, but uh, the Columbia executives, the studio executives, wanted to change the movie's title. They referred to research that showed that the public tended to think the word syndrome 
was a medical term associated with disease. But actress Jane Fonda uh, was had so much clout that she made the studio accept the China Syndrome as the title. Um, and it was so serious that uh, or, or Michael Douglas, who was the producer of this movie as well, uh, he wanted it to be so serious that the, the movie end credits have no music. It just goes in silence because, you know, you're supposedly so shocked at the, the outcome of the film. You know, we always like to talk about casting. Uh, Richard Dreyfus was originally cast as the cameraman but pulled out uh, shortly before filming, and Michael Douglas stepped in kind of at the last minute. Jack Nicholson turned down the role of uh, Jack Goodell, who's uh, the, the character that Lemon played, because he was busy filming The Shining. Mm-hmm. And uh, the role of Kimberly Wells, which was Jane Fonda's role, and again, she was nominated for an Oscar, it was originally written for a man. So uh, a lot of changes there. Kind of another sort of fun behind the scene. I mean, it was a serious movie, but um, and, and it wasn't fun. <laughs> Jane Fonda broke her ankle towards the end of the shoot and had to be flown away for treatment. But fun fact, this is where I'm getting at, uh, she could no longer take ballet classes as she had done for years, so she took up aerobics instead, which led to her famous exercise video franchise <laughs> of uh, Jane Fonda's aerobics. So uh, that worked out well for her uh, in the end. It was a great uh, movie that was very serious. And at the time, kind of a movie, too. Wouldn't you agree, Joe? Because that we heard about nuclear power plants. We, as a generation, as a society, didn't know a ton about them. So when we see this movie going on and then Three Mile Island happening, it was real fearful. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, and I guess this is a good thing, even though we still have many, if not more, nuclear weapons in our in our uh, worldwide arsenal. But I think kids today, you know, don't even really think about that. And uh, uh, that was definitely a fear I had growing up. And uh, this movie kind of started a little bit of a trend, although, you know, this movie is about uh, a, a nuclear, potential nuclear disaster more than it is actual nuclear war. But this movie kind of started a trend that kind of continued in the early 80s where we had movie, TV movies like The Day After or the British film Threads uh, and other movies that kind of dealt with uh, more, you know, the drama of uh, potential nuclear war. Um, and, I, you know, I guess I should correct myself a little bit because certainly we had uh, Dr. Strangelove and Failsafe in the early 60s uh, which was, you know, timed around the Bay of Pigs and things like that. So uh, it wasn't a new thing, but it started a, a, a new cycle of films, is what we call it, in Hollywood in the early 80s. 1979's The China Syndrome. If you haven't seen this ever or in a long time, recommend it. It is, but it's an intense film and certainly one to pay close attention. I absolutely love this film, The China Syndrome, 1979. Joe, great stuff as always, my friend. We'll do it again next week as we go to film school. I look forward to it. See you then. There you go. Film study professor Joe Fortunato joins us Fridays at this.